My name is Susan Carroll, and it's my pleasure to be your MC for this two-day event. Our topic is a very timely one. Ten years after its conception, has the banking union stood the test of time? Well, we're going to find out over the next two days. But before we officially start, just a bit of information from me, particularly for those of you joining us online. And we had more than 600 people registered. Thank you very much for that. Just to tell you how you can interact with us. We will be taking questions via Mentimeter. You can see on your screens details of how to submit them. For our in-person audience, I think the traditional raising of the hand still works just fine. You can also follow the discussions online on Twitter using the hashtag SRBECB2022. Finally, a hint to all of our speakers. We are on the record. Our speeches and our discussions are being streamed live on the SRB and ECB websites and also on YouTube. Now let's get started. It's my pleasure to hand over to our joint host, Andrea Enria, Chair of the Supervisory Board of the European Central Bank, for some opening words. Mr Enria. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really very glad uh, to welcome you to uh, our first conference, Joint ECB and uh, Single Resolution Board. Uh, uh, we have been thinking about this for a while, and finally we managed to do it, and finally we managed to do it uh, in person, at least in part, and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, at, at the exact time of uh, the 10 years anniversary of the conception of the Banking Union, which was proposed at the uh, European Council uh, at the end of June in 2012, so 10 years ago. However, the single supervisory mechanism uh, was not legally enforced until two and a half years after that decision, and it was uh, after four years that uh, the single resolution board uh, was legally operational. So from the point of view of uh, our age, uh, the, the two uh, institutions, the two pillars uh, of, of the banking union have been operational for much less than a decade. But yet, I think that we can say that we have uh, achieved uh, quite a lot in this, uh, in this period. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the considerable reduction in uh, non-performing loans, the, 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 the risking of the bank's uh, balance sheet uh, uh, from 8% NPR ratio in 2014 when the ECB started these tasks uh, to the end of last year, 2%. And... Uh, uh, also, the, the supervisory response to the crisis, not to the pandemic, that was uh, very, very fast and enabled banks uh, to continue supporting corporates and households uh, also in the first uh, uh, very difficult times uh, of, the, of, the, of that crisis. And, uh, um, and empirical evidence shows that that uh, space that we gave as supervisors was uh, useful, no? For, was used by banks to continue supporting lending and uh, and, uh, and the economy as a whole. Also, the, distribution, the, the, the decision not to distribute uh, dividends, to recommend not to distribute dividends, and to create uh, uh, operational relief for the banks, I think, was very, very useful at that time. But what, for me, was really key was that, for the first time, there was a joined-up response. So supervisory, uh, monetary policy, fiscal response, regulations, everything moved in the same direction, showing that uh, uh, a symmetric shock was actually met with a comprehensive policy action at the European level for the first time. And also the, the SRB, of course, uh, Elke will say much more than I can, but uh, established itself as a, as a strong pan-European resolution authority. And this was reflected not only in terms of uh, banks' preparedness, so uh, uh, through resolution planning and uh, a minimum requirement for own funds and eligible liabilities, but also swift interventions in the few cases, luckily, that we had, or banks that we had failing uh, or likely to fail in these first years of the banking union. Um, so this unified response would not have been possible if it was not uh, with the banking union in place. Would have been unthinkable, really. And I want to stress that, and that's why this meeting for me is important, is that close cooperation between the SSM and the SRB has been integral part of our efforts throughout uh, all these years. Take also our joint handling of recent crisis cases such as Bear Bank. I mean, given the limited time available to respond to fast-moving crisis situations and the relatively complex, let's say, decision-making processes that we have, uh, it would be... Uh, 
impossible, I would say, without effective cooperation uh, to manage the orderly wind down of a bank. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this concerns not only the quick exchange of information no, at the time, but also the consultation and cooperation between the two authorities as provided by legislation throughout the whole process. And uh, this, uh, this, um, this cooperation is not, this collaboration is not only an issue of uh, the last days of, of life of a bank. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the end point of a coordination process that starts much, uh, much earlier, as set out also in our interinstitutional memorandum of understanding. Uh, to make sure that both institutions are on the same page when push comes to shove, uh, the ECB is consulted on the resolution plans of, that the SRB prepares, while the SRB provides feedback, of course, on the recovery plans of significant institutions that the ECB is responsible for. And our information exchange is not limited to, uh, to crisis cases, but uh, we are also sharing insights on key system-wide vulnerabilities. We, for instance, now uh, work together in, uh, in the extended contact group monitoring developments following the aggression of Russia in, in, in Ukraine. And uh, we are exchanging always bank-specific information, also matters such as MREL. So we have come a long way. Uh, we have certainly not yet reached our final destination. Uh, the banking union remains incomplete in several respects. Uh, for large banks, we have a uniform and effective crisis management framework in place, but the same cannot be said for small and medium-sized banks. Prudential regulatory barriers to a truly single European banking market remain in terms of home, what we call home most, I hate uh, referring to home most for something that happens within the banking union, but still what we improperly call home most issues uh, 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 within the banking union. And the third pillar of the banking union, of course, a common deposit insurance scheme is still missing. All these issues were discussed at the Eurogroup meeting last week, but an agreement on a roadmap to complete the banking union proved elusive uh, once again. These are complex political negotiations that go to the very heart of the kind of union we, we want as European citizens. And here I'm not talking only about the banking union, but also about the European Union itself. Uh, it is only natural that we, uh, there are different viewpoints and that negotiations are proving complex. But as I've said uh, time and again, uh, uh, I'm... I'm today more convinced than ever that we cannot stand still while complex political negotiations play out. Uh, this is why we have, I, my colleagues, uh, the colleagues in the SRB, uh, once and again uh, explored avenues to maximize the full potential of the legal and regulatory framework that we currently have in place. This concern in particular the prudential regulatory obstacles still impeding the cross-border integration of the EU banking sector. Uh, more recently, I raised also some, you know, uh, proposal for incremental reforms of our crisis management framework, in particular for the resolution of mid-sized banks. Uh, we regularly discuss these issues with LK, with the colleagues at the, at the SRB, and I believe we share a lot of views on a number of issues as a result of our common experience with crisis cases in the first years of the banking union. These reforms should, in my opinion, include an expansion of the pool of banks which qualify for resolution, an expanded role for DGS for deposit guarantee schemes, other than their pay box function, boosting the ability to fund on a list cost basis the smooth exit from the market, also smaller banks, a widespread use of the purchase and assumption transactions that along the years have proved to be the cornerstone of the US successful framework for crisis management resolution and therefore a harmonized framework for administrative liquidation. I mean, they're all very consistent and part of a, of a package in my, in my view. Um, and again, even though I was disappointing as everybody else here, here in this room that uh, there couldn't be broader agreement uh, in uh, last week, I take comfort from the fact that the finance ministers uh, agreed to improve the resolution framework, mostly along the lines that we discussed with our colleagues and which seems to be important uh, you know, improvements uh, based on the experience that we had so far. 
Uh, I'm about to give to, uh, to the floor to Commissioner McGuinness to kick off the conference with her keynote speech and would like to underscore that I personally look forward to cooperating with her, with Elke, with Sean, offering all the technical advice uh, my staff can provide for a comprehensive review of the crisis management framework in order to make it more effective. At ECB Banking Supervision, we are acutely aware that an effective framework for market exit uh, that does not imperil financial stability is key for an efficient banking sector, able also to compete on a global scale. And I'm reassured by the fact that at least this prong of the regulatory reform program has been mandated to the ordinary legislative procedure with initiative from the Commission and agreement between the co-legislators, because I believe in this way uh, the entrenched political obstacles, the red lines that we have been hearing about in this period go in the second, uh, in the second line and, uh, and we have the appropriate decision-making process to try to move uh, ahead. I'm sure that these two days we will be hearing many analyses and proposals on how to improve our current uh, regulatory framework, both for the SSM and the SRB. And again, I'm sure that the discussion will be extremely insightful and fruitful, even though uh, the holy grail of the single deposit guarantee scheme will not be at the center stage of the table. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and, uh, and, uh, and the debate. So after Commissioner McGuinness' keynote speech, uh, today's first panel, moderated by uh, Laura Noonan, uh, will discuss how to move crisis management forward, and I look forward to the insights from our pal panelists, Sean Berrigan, Elke Koenig, uh, Peter Simon, and uh, Irene Tinayi will offer to us. The following panel will have its eyes firmly on the future. Jennifer Baker will moderate a discussion with Patricia Boydens, David Martin Lopez, and Marilyn Picaro, on how the banking sector might look like in 2040. Following tomorrow's keynote speech by Johan Thais, a topic that has become even more salient due to the Russia's war in Ukraine, will take center stage, operational resilience. The ECB and banks alive, alike actually have already been on, on a high alert for cyber risk uh, and Russia's waging war on Ukraine with increasing risk of cyber attacks has only heightened our and the bank's vigilance in this area. While so far cyber attacks were primarily financially motivated, there is now a threat that aims at, at the destruction of critical infrastructures, uh, trying to cause as much disruption as possible. Elena Carletti, Elizabeth McCall, Christian Ossig, and Fernando Restoy will explore ways of safeguarding banks' operational resilience in these turbulent times in a discussion moderated by Raymond Franken. And Elke will tomorrow conclude the conference with her closing remarks. Before I conclude uh, this short introduction, allow me to, el to thank uh, Elke for the very fruitful cooperation along these years, both when I was chairing the European Banking Authority and now as uh, chair of the ECB Supervisory Board. I've already praised the, the, the level of cooperation and information sharing between our two institutions, but I would also like to thank, uh, to thank Elke for our personal interaction and cooperation during this period. She has been an outstanding first chair of the Single Resolution Board, and I know from personal experience that it's not so easy to set up new institutions, and especially so if you need to tackle difficult challenges in the first years of, of your life. And, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, this is the first SRB and ECB conference, but also the last that we will host together. Elke will leave at the end of this year. I will leave at the end of next year. But uh, we still have full six months to collaborate closely, hopefully not on concrete crisis cases. And the close collaboration between the SRB and the ECB, I think, is really is a, is a strength of our institutional framework. And this has been built also through the, I mean, institutions are made also of people and uh, the, the good relationship between the leadership of, of the two institutions, which has been built by Daniel Nui, by Elke, partly by myself, is something that I think uh, we need to treasure and preserve in the years to come. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.